The final class of fallacies that we're going to study are fallacies of relevance. What makes something a fallacy of relevance is that an arguer presents information in the premises of an argument that simply isn't relevant for the argument's conclusion. Now one thing that makes the fallacies of relevance a little easier to remember than, say, the fallacies of presumption is that most of them fall under a number of subcategories. Now the first subcategory that we're going to study will be the fallacies of personal attack. What ties all these fallacies together is that an arguer is attempting to undermine another person's argument or beliefs, but they're doing it not by attacking the argument or beliefs themselves, but rather by attacking the arguer. The first fallacy of personal attack is the genetic fallacy. What's distinctive about the genetic fallacy is that an arguer focuses on the circumstances that a person was in when he or she formed their beliefs or arguments and then uses these circumstances to dismiss the argument or beliefs. In some ways this is very much the same as the circumstantial ad hominem fallacy that we'll be discussing shortly. However, with circumstantial ad hominem, the claim being made is that the person has a vested interest in the argument or beliefs that they're holding, and so we reject their argument on that basis. With genetic fallacy, however, we're just looking at the origins of the person's beliefs. When we evaluate the argument, we should be able to explain how it is that the arguer is using the origins of the other's argument or belief to dismiss the argument or belief. So as an example, Dr. Smith predicts that humans will go extinct within 100,000 years, but I don't accept his hypothesis as he was suffering from depression when he formulated it. Now, of course, the emotional or mental state that Smith was in when he formulated his hypothesis isn't relevant to the hypothesis' truth. When we assume otherwise, we're committing the genetic fallacy. The next fallacy of personal attack is abusive ad hominem. With abusive ad hominem, there's a direct attack against another person, and it generally involves some sort of name calling. So in the evaluation of this fallacy, you should be able to explain how an arguer dismisses another's argument through name calling or through a personal attack, and note how this doesn't suffice. I used to find her thoughts on string theory intriguing until I found out she's just some redneck. In the analysis, you'd say, the arguer commits the fallacy of abuse of ad hominem as he attacks the scientist for being a redneck. This is simply name calling. It really has no relevance to the evidence for or against the scientist's ideas on string theory. You might be asking yourself, well, what distinguishes abuse of ad hominem from question begging epithet? With question begging epithet, you're using epithets in order to support your own belief. Abuse of ad hominem, in a sense, does use epithets but the arguer is using these epithets to undermine somebody else's belief. So the use to which the epithet is put is different in each fallacy. Next we have poisoning the well. In some ways, poisoning the well is like abuse of ad hominem. However, in this fallacy, an arguer is trying to undermine an opponent so that anything that the opponent says is not seen as credible. Example, I tell you he's hiding something. And the fact that he denies he's hiding something is precisely what you'd expect to hear from someone who's hiding something. It seems like no matter what the accused person says, his claims will be dismissed by the arguer as not credible. So you're poisoning the well against the person. In poisoning the well, you're weakening the person's credibility so that he or she simply won't be believed no matter what. The next fallacy is circumstantial ad hominem. As noted earlier, circumstantial ad hominem involves a claim that somebody has a stake in what they're saying, and they wouldn't be saying what they are without having that vested interest. For example, Senator Smith argues that the cigarette taxes are unproductive, but that's what you'd expect someone to say when they receive massive funding from the tobacco industry. Now, of course, the fact that Senator Smith receives massive funding from the tobacco industry does give us a reason to be suspicious of his motives. However, notice that this has nothing to do with the validity of Senator Smith's position. There might actually be very good reasons for what the senator says. So if we simply reject the person's position out of hand because they have a vested interest, that's fallacious. Somewhat related to circumstantial ad hominem is 
tu quoque. Tu quoque, remember, is a Latin term that means you too. When somebody commits a tu quoque, what they're effectively saying is, we should reject somebody else's position because they are a hypocrite. Notice that simply calling somebody a hypocrite is not a tu quoque. A tu quoque fallacy involves the additional step of saying that because somebody's a hypocrite, we shouldn't believe what they say. For example, it was just reported that Mr. Jones, an anti-illegal immigration lobbyist, employed illegal immigrants as nannies. So much for his arguments against illegal immigration. So yes, there is a charge here that Mr. Jones is a hypocrite with respect to illegal immigration. But that doesn't mean that his arguments are illegitimate. It just means that he's a hypocrite. When we take the further step to dismiss his arguments on the basis of his hypocrisy, then we've committed the fallacy. The second category of fallacies of relevance is fallacies of appeal to false authority. What ties all of these fallacies together is that someone is appealing to somebody else or a group of other people in order to justify his or her own beliefs. The most basic form of this is an appeal to the one. To identify this fallacy, what we're looking for is somebody who is appealing to somebody else's opinions when in fact that other person really doesn't have any sort of real authority on the issue. For example, I just saw an American Express commercial featuring LeBron James. I think I'll open an account. What makes this an appeal to the one is that the arguer is appealing to LeBron James's apparent authority on credit cards and using that authority to say that he or she will be opening an American Express account because of that. Of course, sometimes it's not the authority of a single individual that holds sway with us, but rather that an opinion or argument is held by a large number of people. When we use that as the basis for our beliefs, then we're committing the appeal to the many fallacy. So what we're looking for with this fallacy is that somebody is trying to justify their own position just because many or most other people believe similarly. Here's a basic example. There's more matter than space in this table. Everyone knows that. Well, notice that whether a belief is widespread really has no bearing on its truth. Yes, there might be good evidence for why a lot of people hold a certain belief, but it's that evidence that justifies the belief. The fact that a lot of people believe it doesn't justify it. So when we appeal to the fact that a belief is widespread, we're committing the fallacy. The appeal to the select few is a little bit different from the previous fallacies. With this fallacy, an individual is looking at some elite group and trying to emulate them. They want to be like them. So only the wealthy drive Jaguars, so they must be good cars. The simple fact that wealthy people drive them is being used as some justification for their being good, as if the wealthy have some special sort of inside knowledge about them. But what's really happening here is that the arguer is simply appealing to the desires to be associated with the wealthy. The wealthy could be buying and driving Jaguars simply because of the status that they bring, not because of their quality. The final fallacy in this grouping is appeal to tradition. With appeal to tradition, somebody is committing some variant of the argument form, X is the case, because it has always been held to be so. The belief that bad smells cause disease, which is called the miasma theory, traces back to the third century physician Galen. Surely something that was believed for so long must be true. Well, not necessarily. There are a lot of beliefs that have been held for a very long time simply because people didn't have any good alternatives. So in your analysis, you would note that many traditional beliefs have turned out to be wrong. And even in those cases where the belief is correct, it's the reasoning behind the belief that's relevant. If we simply say X is true because it has been held for a very long time, that's a fallacy. The final subset of fallacies of relevance are appeals to emotion. With an appeal to emotion, you're trying to justify some belief by stirring up emotions in your audience. The first example of this is mob appeal. Sometimes students will mix up mob appeal with appeal to the many. But remember that appeal to the many involves a claim that something is true because the majority of people believe it. Mob appeal, on the other hand, is an attempt to whip up a we're all in this together sort of feeling. For example, 
The Dallas Cowboys are America's team. That's why you should root for them. When you use a term like America's team, that's trying to pull people together. It's trying to stir a common sort of emotion that will tie them together. It's a kind of appeal to a sense of patriotism and then attaching it to the Cowboys. But of course, simply calling the Cowboys America's team isn't a real reason for why you should root for them. The next fallacy, appeal to pity, appeals to a specific kind of emotion. With this fallacy, an arguer is trying to get someone to believe something simply by stirring up the feeling of pity in his or her audience. So, poor Johnny just couldn't tear himself away from his video games, which is why he lost his scholarship and now can't afford to go to college. He really should be given another chance. It's true that we might justifiably feel bad for Johnny. However, to take the additional step to say that he should be given another chance is an appeal to pity. After all, there might be other deserving students out there who could just as easily use the money without squandering it. Another appeal to emotion that focuses on a specific emotion is appeal to fear. Again, with this fallacy, an arguer is trying to get us to believe something through stirring up the feeling of fear in his or her audience. For example, as Blaise Pascal argued, if God exists and we don't believe in him, we risk eternal punishment. That's how we can be assured that God exists. What's subtle about this example is that Pascal actually provides a perhaps justified reason to believe in God. However, it's an appeal to fear to think that his reasoning supports the truth of the claim that God exists. In other words, Pascal gives us a pragmatic reason to believe in God, but he doesn't really provide us any evidence for the claim that God exists. The final two fallacies of relevance don't fall under any subcategories. The first of these is an appeal to ignorance. Now remember that with appeal to ignorance, nobody is calling anybody else ignorant. Instead, the general form here is somebody says something is true because it hasn't been shown to be otherwise. For example, studies have been inconclusive about whether it is safe to consume milk from cows raised with bovine growth hormone, so it must be safe. But of course, a failure to prove that BGH is harmful does not support the claim that it is therefore safe. The final fallacy is the straw man fallacy. What happens in a straw man fallacy is somebody misrepresents somebody else's argument or position in such a way that it's then easy to knock down. The imagery here is that we have turned the opponent into a person of straw. Representative Anderson has claimed that we don't have sufficient evidence of espionage to impose economic sanctions on Argentina. How Anderson can be supportive of the Argentinian regime is beyond me and shows why he should be removed from office. Notice the shift that occurs between the first and second sentences in this example. In the first sentence, it's being noted that Anderson is claiming that we can't impose economic sanctions on Argentina. But his position in the second sentence is then being changed to saying that he's in some way supportive of the regime. That's a different sort of claim. What the arguer here has done is try to shift Anderson's position from one which is reasonable to one which is entirely untenable. That is, that we should support an oppressive regime. Anderson has been turned into a straw man. I hope that the information presented in this lecture has been relevant and has helped you to understand each of these fallacies. It's now time to turn to the exercise sets.